Give your neighbor a high five or a gentle hug or something. Amen. And thank them. Y'all can put that back. Can I get this in this monitor just a little bit um, just to hear this? Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless the Lord. Amen. Bless the Lord. Yeah. Bless God. Amen. Uh, I almost said y'all excuse me, but no need to excuse what God wants done. Amen. 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 Do me a favor, um, whoever's working production stuff, if we can put on uh, the first slide on the screen. I just want to go through something. I'm going to move quick because God already told me this week I'm going to be on this subject for about two or three weeks. And I need you all to stick it out with me because he's jacking me up right now. Okay? Because um, I'm going to begin, like I said last week, I am learning what worship is. I really am. I'm learning what worship is. And today I hope to uncover just a little piece of it. Uh, I don't know how deep we can go because it's some heavy stuff. And here's what I said on Wednesday. It might prove quite challenging. So now I know why God wanted us to worship him um, so we can get to where we know. This is, um, this is, um, is this it? Let me see. Um, yes. Yeah. This was last week, what we talked about last week. Uh, this was the big idea for last week, that every believer is invited to God's throne room so they can develop a lifestyle of continual worship, which results from an encounter with his holiness, his eternal greatness, sovereignty, majesty, and power. Let me just say this one thing, and I'm going to move to what I want to talk this morning. Um, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, I think it was around verse 2 or 3, um, John said, while on the Isle of Patmos, um, I stood and behold, there was a door standing open in heaven. Then he went on to say that I was extended an invitation. Then at once I was in the spirit and I saw this throne sitting in heaven. Um, and he goes on to describe the throne. Here's what happened Wednesday. We learn in its most elementary form what it means to be in the spirit and how easy it is to stay in the spirit. We learn that. So, so I'm wishing that everybody comes out on Wednesday or we're here on this past Wednesday because we're just learning some good stuff as it relates to going on. John, can we take some of the bottom out of this? It's just really, really basic. Um, so where we could uh, learn what the spirit is and get to where God is. Um, here's what I want to do. Go to Romans. I'm going to move you back and forth. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I need you to go there in your Bible with me because I'm not going to get far this morning. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Yeah. <sighs> I need a good Pentecostal person. <laughs> Baptists won't do in this situation. That's what I'm talking about. Good. Thank you. I need you to read that like old school, man. You got to belt that thing out, man. Yeah. Y'all listen, listen. Go for it. Amen. Thank you, Jay. Pray. Show him some love, man. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I felt that. I felt that. You know, I felt that. You know, the reading of the word of God. Come on, y'all. I felt that. I felt that. Thank you, man. Come on. We can do better than that. Yeah, that's, yeah. I felt that. The reason I wanted that read is because that scripture is the New Testament version, in my humble opinion, of the beginning of what I'm going to share with you today. Most of the people, um, New Testament individuals, scholars, theologians, when they're going to talk about worship, they'll begin there. Um, I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of brothers and sisters, that you present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. And it says this is your reasonable or spiritual act of worship, depending on your translation. Be not conformed to this world any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to prove what God's will is. Good, pleasing, perfect, acceptable, depending on your translation. Um, that's a very, very important because your spiritual act of worship. Come on, say my right way to worship. 
Say it again. Say, my right way to worship. I want us to understand that because all I'm going to do today is just lay foundation, and then we're going to move through um, these. I guess I'm going to talk from Exodus chapter 20. So go ahead and go to Exodus chapter 20. No, don't, don't go there. Go to Exodus chapter 1 and land there. Yeah, Exodus chapter 1. I'm going to show you something, and then we're going to walk through the passage of Scripture to get to where we need to go. Now, um, put the second slide on the screen, please. I want um, that up there so we can kind of, the next one, um, the one that's, ah, yeah, there we go. Good, good. Um, then we're going to talk there and allow God to have got his way in our midst. I want us to see this before we even can move on. Okay. Because of who God is and what he has done for us, he alone deserves to be worshipped. I'm going to be really, really slow this morning. Normally I speed things up, okay? And we can get out in time, so don't panic. Because of who God is and what he has done for us, he alone deserves to be worshipped. Nothing else. Nothing else. I think it was, I think I'm, I don't know if it was Matt Redman that penned a song, if I'm wrong with the author, correct me, but he says, when the music fades, uh, who was it? Don, I think it was Don, yeah. And all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. Here's what he says. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you desire. You search much deeper within. Ah, you're looking into my heart. Then the refrain, he says, I'm coming back to the heart of worship because it's all about you. All about you. The majority of us, all we know about worship is a song and not a lifestyle. Can I say that? And so I want to begin the process of teaching worship outside a song. <laughs> that way we could stay in continual worship. Is that, you guys are right with me? So we could stay in continual worship outside of the song, okay? So, so here's what I want to read in Exodus. Go to Exodus chapter 8, chapter 1, I'm sorry. And then I'm just gonna gonna read, and then we're gonna be in these passages for a while, so you don't want to miss what we're going to be sharing there. Okay. I'm gonna read, and I'll give you some literary context. If you're in verse eight, say Amen. And that sounded like Connie's there. I want to hear the rest of us. Are you there? Okay. Good. Good. Now I want y'all to read this um, because uh, this, if you don't track with me, you'll you you'll miss this. Verse 1 says, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 8. Did I mess that up again? Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Say, so we pray for you, preacher. There you go, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chapter 1, verse 8. There, there. Everybody there now? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. All right. I'm in the right place. I don't know what y'all's problem is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, you there? Now watch this, watch this. I want y'all, because the goal is I want you to understand scripture. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. You there? Verse 9 says, and he said to the people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Verse 11 says, therefore set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities and Python and Ramses. And verse 12 says, but the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread or fear of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people work as slaves. And on and on. Let me read the rest. And made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick 
and in all kinds of work in the field. And in all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Now go over to Exodus chapter 20. Now, now, yeah, go there, yeah. Exodus 20. And go to verse 1. Okay. Yeah. You guys are there? Okay. Here's what it says. Uh, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, verse 20, verses 1 through uh, we're going to go all the way to 11 in the next couple of weeks, okay? Um, verse 7 is going to take us one week to do. Now, say, say, this is after. Uh, come on, come on, say, this is after. Now, now, so you know, the reason I have you repeat things is not so I could be cool or to sound like some televangelist or something like that. Uh, I just, when you hear and when you vocalize, it sticks in the memory a little more. That's all, okay? And I want you to understand what I'm doing and what I'm saying. Say, this is after. Now, what we just read in chapter 1, verse 8, that was before. Come on, say before. before. So here's the deal. Before, you see them going in, and you're seeing oppression setting in, and then after, you see God communicating something to them. Are you with me? Today is before. <laughs> Tomorrow is going to be after. Are you with me? We're going to learn what it means to worship God. So let me help you what's happening here by way of literary context. And then I'm just going to share the few things I want you all to take away with. I'm just going to speak from my spirit this morning. Um, so I want you all to hear me. Prior to chapter 20, 40 years plus um, preceding chapter 20, the Israelites had just been delivered from slavery in Egypt. Here's what you need to know. In chapter 1, verse 8, 440 plus years prior to the time of chapter 20, God, by means of divine providence, allowed Joseph to take the Israelites as a place of security and safety into the land of Egypt. And so God created this place of hiding for them. And here's what the text says in chapter 1, verse 8. This new king comes on the scene, and the author says um, that he did not know who Joseph was. Now, what I need you to understand about the importance of that statement and in the changing of these dynasties that were taking place is not so much that this king had never heard the name of Joseph, okay? All he had to do was look around at the remaining cities and the pythons that has been built, all of those were a result of the people that God used Joseph to transition from Canaan to the land of Egypt. Matter of fact, there's no way he could have been king without knowing Egypt's history. That there had been a time when there was seven years of famine, come on, and seven years of plenty, and how it was this, this person who served a God that was not a part of the Egyptian dynasty to save them. So what the author is trying to communicate is not that this, this, this new king didn't know who Joseph was, but the truth existed that he didn't know who Joseph's God was. Are you with me? And because he didn't know Joseph's God, he subjected the very people that God used to preserve him to cruel and unnecessary punishment. Okay? Now here's the, the data that I want you to understand so we can get to chapter 20. Going into Egypt, it was not a monotheistic nation. That means that it was not a one-God rule place. 
Egypt was a place, it was very polytheistic. They had a God for everything. There was a God for the sun. There was a God for the rain. There was a God for the water. There was a God, I mean, you name it, it was very polytheistic in that they worshiped many gods. Matter of fact, in, in the Egyptian culture, Pharaoh himself was considered to be the God that was over all the other gods. Are you with me? Now, you must understand with me, now all of a sudden, the Israelites find themselves in Egypt for 400 plus years. Over that length of time, it wasn't so much that God forgot them, but the truth exists that they might have forgotten who God was. Oh, I just need an amen or two just to kind of help me hurry along. Are you tracking with me? So you will remember with me, when Moses comes on the scene 400 years later, Moses might have heard about God, but he had never encountered him. I'm talking about Jehovah, I mean Yahweh Elohim. So remember at the burning bush, when Moses encountered God and God said to him, hey, I am the Lord God. I need you to go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. Moses' response to God was this, which one are you? Come on, are you with me? He had never seen a one God rule place. I wish I had somebody in here. Matter of fact, remember with me, he went to church with Pharaoh. He was raised, come on, don't act like you didn't notice. He was raised in Pharaoh's household. He was probably groomed to become the next God over, I wish I had somebody in here, over Egypt. He went to Egyptian schools. He wore Egyptian dress that had anything. So all of a sudden, this one fellow shows up saying, I am God. I need you to go to Pharaoh to tell him, let my people go. The natural thing for Moses to do, hey, dude, you don't know what you're asking me to do. It's one of you. It's a whole lot of them. And to help you out, they all named God. <laughs> so, so, so which one are you? And, 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 and here's what God says. And don't miss the nuance what I'm about to say to you. If I give you a name, you'll try to restrict me solely to the name. Y'all didn't get it. Because the reason we worship certain things and only one thing is because God showed up in the thing and we violated the second commandment by made in a graven image in the name of God in the shape of the thing and the thing now has us. In case you're missing me, let me help you. God gave you, you say, this is how you say, God blessed me with a car and so now you're worshiping the car instead of God and... and, and so Moses, let me not give you a name, and let me hurry on. You remember with me now, the fight between God and Pharaoh was all the plagues was simply about God showing Pharaoh who's the bigger God, who is the true God, who is the one and only God. And the only reason Pharaoh let the Israelites go was because God showed Pharaoh that Yahweh Elohim has power to kill the succeeding God. Y'all missed that, y'all missed that, y'all missed that. The reason he went after the firstborn is because when Pharaoh died, their God would continue to live because his son would come up. God killed his son and said, now what? So here we are, 40 plus years later, the Israelites now have been released from Egypt and now God is all already, now he's about to say to them, hey, I have to erase from your head the concept of worship. Because for 400 years, all you know about worship is worshiping all these many gods. Come on, y'all. When you need water, you'd probably go to the Egyptian temple and you'd see them bow down before this thing they'd call the rain god. And, and even though it was me sending the rain, I allowed them to fool themselves into thinking. Come on. And, and you've seen polytheistic worship and, and, and you've worshipped Pharaoh. Matter of fact, you've built shrines and temples to him and all this stuff. Now I need to set the record straight. You need to know who I am, what I've done for you, so you can worship me correctly and you can worship me alone. So I need to erase your framework of what worship is and redefine worship in your life. So now notice how he picks up. Look with me at verse 1. 
So now he's conversing with Moses on a mountain, and he says to Moses, and God spoke these things, uh, these words saying, and look at verse 20, verse 2. I am Yahweh Elohim, and in my translation it has a comma. Some of your translation might have some sort of a punctuative mark to separate what's coming next, okay? Moses let the record reflect. I am what I call the present tense of the verb to be, meaning, Moses, let me remind you, I continually become what you need me to be at the time that you need me to be it. Moses, I never stop being. So I can say in the true sense of the word, I'm the same yesterday, I'm the same today, come on, and I'm going to be the same, are, are you with me? So it's not Moses like I did something here, and I'm going to stop doing it now because I ran out of things, I am. And, and, and in case you that I am, I am Yahweh Elohim. And that's the same phrase Moses heard when he was in the mountain. And mind you, Moses, 40 years later, had just experienced the I am-ness of God. He saw him um, dealt with the frog. He saw him deal with the boils. He saw him deal with the God of locust fertility. He saw him turn the water into blood. He saw him kill Pharaoh's firstborn. He saw him part the Red Sea. He saw them give them manna when they needed it. Come on. He saw them put the serpent up to heal them when they were sick. So like we would say today, he was water in a dry land. He was bread for the hungry. Come on. He was a mother to the motherless. He was a home for the homeless. Come on. He was a doctor in the sick room. He was a lawyer in the courtroom. So God is saying, Moses, I am that I am. And, and he attaches a descriptive tip. I'm the same God who brought you out of slavery in the land of Egypt. Now, in case some of y'all are saying, I ain't been enslaved, let me help you about the same God. He's the same one that delivered you from the drug addiction. He's the same one that brought you through the marital difficulties. He's the same one that brought you to the overdose situation. He's the same one that gave you money when you lost your job. He's the same one that, that come on, come on, took you through your marital challenges. He's the same one that was with you in the midst of the jail situation. He's the same God, and he's saying, because of what I did for you, you ought to worship me right. Church, I need you to hear me real quick. Here is how he's opened up. I am Yahweh Elohim who brought you out. And, and in case you're sitting there all pompous and righteous and acting like you hadn't done nothing yet, the only reason you're here is because the same God brought you out. Come on, come on. You might fool your neighbor. You might fool your friend. But the same God who was with you yesterday is the same God that's with you today. So he's making a declaration. I am that I am. Brought you out of Egypt. Come on, turn your neighbor and say, neighbor. I might not have known what you did, but God sure does. Yeah, yeah, God sure does. God sure does. So hear this, hear this, hear this, hear this. And what I like about what the author is implying in the text is that if somebody else had ability to do it for you, they would have done it. But we needed God. All right, so number one, because of who he is and what he's done, we need to only worship him. Now watch the second thing, and I'm hurrying on. Verse two, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Verse three, first command, you shall have no other gods before what? Very, very important statement. God's, it's still Elohim in the Hebrew, but I like the translation in that they put a small g to separate the two. This is not the I am that I am. This is the God that I am created. Think about it, think about it, think about it, okay? This is not the creator. This is the created thing. Let me help you all out. 
Don't, I mean, can I get an attitude for a while? Don't you ever <laughs> put anything I created in front of me. Because it wasn't that thing who brought you out. I did. You got, you got to hear this, guys. You, you must hear this. You must hear this. You must hear this. You must hear this. I don't care if it's your mama. I don't care if it's your wife. I don't care if it's your job. I don't care if it's your home. Like grandma say, what's the never it is? Don't you ever, that's E-V-A, put that thing in front of me. Now, now listen, 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 listen carefully. Now, it's a cute statement, and it sounds well, but I don't know that we really understand what the statement means because my problem is the reason I go in and out of worship and the reason I don't worship God alone and I'm learning how to do that is because I too have made the mistake and sometimes continue to make the mistake of putting the created thing before the creator. Here's how Romans said it. In view of God's mercies, Present yourself as living, living sacrifice is your proper act of worship. So come on, say, don't ever. Just say with me. Come on, say, don't. Come on. Yeah. Come on, I don't care what nationality you are. Just say just one. Just say one. Ever. And you got to bite your tongue when you say your, your top lip. But ever. <laughs> yeah. Don't ever put anything in the presence of God, okay? Now watch, watch, watch verse 4. Look at what it says in verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved or graven image, and I'm almost done, or any likeness of anything in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. So, so here's what he's saying real quick. Um, remember with me, the whole premise of Egypt was the fact that they would make these images to represent Pharaoh. Y'all know this. Come on. You see the Sphinx. You see all the stuff that had the, the, the Egyptian hat, and, the, and it looked like Pharaoh, and the people would worship it. Um, this is not a strike on any religion or anything, but if you were to go into some of our liturgical worship places like the Catholicism, you see all the images and all these types of things. Here's what he's saying. Don't you dare try to make anything that looks like me. Because we saw last week, the reason the throne was empty, so we don't restrict God to an image or to a thing. Let me say this about the text. If no other gods is supposed to take the place of the true God, don't allow anything that looks like anything take the place of God in the earth realm. This is where it gets rough. Your car, cable, cell phone, bill, um, home, internet, new pair of shoes, nails, Hair did. No. <laughs> I want y'all to track with me. I'm going to share this in a little while. And I'm going to leave it alone after this because I'm getting in trouble. Um, don't allow anything that I created become God to you. And you end up worshiping that thing instead of me. Well, let me say it differently. Don't give the thing my worship. Well, let me, let me read it because y'all saying, where are you getting that from? Verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a graven or a carved image of any likeness, heaven above or an earth beneath or water below. Look at verse 5. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, what kind of a God? And look at the next phrase, and I'm going to stop after this. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, and don't read hate in the literal sense, I'll interpret it in a little while, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those 
who love me and keep my commands. Okay. Verse 5. You shall not bow down or serve. Let me deal with those two words briefly. If you were to look at the Septuagint, which is the Old Testament translation of the Hebrew into Greek, that word bow down is the word proskuneo, which you heard me use a couple weeks ago. To pay homage, to kneel before, to lay prostrate before. In other words, don't cause that thing to dictate your name and you respond. And then he has this word, and don't work for the thing. And when you do that, he says, I'm jealous, and I'm going to have a tood. And you're inviting a curse. I'm trying to read this uniquely. Visiting the iniquities of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those, instead of hate, say, disobey me. Disobey yeah, you kind of get what I'm saying. Okay, so let me explain real quick, and then I'm going to stop here, because this is a lot to intake. Because what does that mean? you got to come Wednesday so we can talk through this. Because some of you are already saying, well, i got to make the mortgage payment first. And I'm going to say to you, well, you just created a small g. Let's just be honest about it. Let's talk about the wrong so we can get to right. And anything we put in the place of God, it impedes our worship. That was then, okay? We're going to get to the now. That's before. We're going to get to the after. So here's what that looks like. I say I love God, but I go and I create an expense that impedes my worship for God. I end up bowing to the thing. And the thing forces me to go work so I can pay homage to the thing. And my worship is skewed because it's competing for the God, for place in my life with the God who delivered me from sin in the first place. And if you were here when we talked about second order creation, it's not so much that God made the thing, it's that I made it. Do not make for yourself any graven image in any form or anything, right? Because God wants to be worshipped. Now, here, let me say this real quick and then we'll flesh this out in the upcoming weeks. It's a lot to process. So here's what happens. Because I don't right the wrong, my kids see me, let me use the word in the text now, hating God like that. And so they feel it's natural for them to hate God too because mama did it. So second generation is impacted. Their kids see them doing it because they got it from grandma. And now third generation is impacted because they're doing it Two. Are you with me? And so here's how Malachi put it. You're under a curse. It's not that God is punishing. It's just that the choices we've made based on the disobedience of the command is positioning us where we are. And so their kids come, the fourth generation. It's not that God is such a malicious God that because I did it, he's going to punish my descendants. No, 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 no. Notice the word iniquity. I keep the cycles going because my kids do what they see me do. Are you with me? They don't see me going to worship, so they don't feel they need to go to worship. I wish I had somebody in here. They don't see me prioritizing God, so they don't feel they have a need to prioritize God. Come on. They see me. Let me, this, let me jump ahead to seven. Taking the name of the Lord, the God in vain, so they feel the need to do the same thing. But the last part of that verse says, but I visit those who love me. So I made the mistake. And I created other gods. But years later, verse 20, I decide to fix it. And now first generation sees me fixing it. And I say to them, don't make no other gods. And so here's what this looked like in real life in case you're struggling. Learn how to live debt free. 
And so God releases a blessing on them because they put God first in everything they do. Are you with me? And so they're living the blessed life. Their children see them obeying God, and they teach them put God first. And then in that lineage, all the way, it says to thousands, blessing continues. But it begins with a proper act of worship. Now, I know I said this is harsh. There's grace, there's grace, there's grace, there's grace. So don't walk out of here, oh, I'm going to hell. No, you're not going to hell. God wants us to begin the process of putting him where he rightfully belongs. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Say it, I want you, I want you to hear me. This is what I like about the New Testament, the gracious grace of God, okay? I love Pastor Karen's message. If you listen to what, a lot of what she said, he allows us an opportunity to begin the process of turning it around. If I'm going to worship God, because here's the thing I want us to understand. It does no good to bring him a song if the heart isn't right. This is going to be so heavy, but hear the spirit in which I'm saying. I can shine all day long and go home to the God that I created. What does that do to the God who delivered me? For my worship to be authentic, I need to begin the process of turning things around to put God where he rightfully belongs. Now, I'm going to be black and white because I don't want nobody to walk out of here saying, that, that, you know, you got to go miss a bill to pay God. I want to be black and white with you. Begin the process. And I want you to hear my heart. If all you can give God is a penny to begin the process of putting him where he belongs, give him the penny and don't ever give that penny to another God again. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? And when that penny turns into two pennies, take those two pennies and give it to him. And don't ever give them to another God again. And when it turns into three, on and on and on and on. Are, are, you, are you hearing me? Okay. The New Testament concept is mustard seed faith. I, I want you all to hear me. That's the grace of God. But worship begins by putting God first in our life. First in our life. I can't wait to get to the Sabbath because a lot of us don't even have a Sabbath anymore because we miss all of this, okay? So here's, here's the rule. Let me kind of refresh real quick. I did that for you. Put me first. And don't put no other God before me. So in your worship, in your life, in how we conduct ourselves, God wants to be first. Please hear me. Don't vocalize it and not Live it. Are you hearing me this morning? I'm done. I just want to make this real plain. Don't vocalize it and not live it. Here's the challenge this week. Lord, help me live it. Does this make sense? Because you don't want to be down the cursed path. You want to be down the blessing path. And listen to me carefully. Don't so much only do it for you, but do it for the legacy that you're going to leave behind. Children's children. Are you with me? To begin to change the world. Now, here's how I began the message. The challenge with you and the challenge that we have in the world today with me is that every so often a new king comes on the scene and they make it more difficult because the king don't know who Joseph was. Or they don't know who God is. Come on. All you've got to do is look around in society and you can see all the anti-God things that are competing for God's place in our life. We have choices to make and decisions to make to keep him first. I need you all to say this out loud. Say, put God first. Put God first. Say it again. Say, put God, first. put God first. Bow your heads with me as the worship team comes. You're teaching us God what worship is. You're teaching us. You're teaching me what worship is. My life is prioritized around the world, busyness, stuff that Felix likes, 
And you're telling me revisit that because the stuff didn't bring me out of Egypt. The stuff doesn't have a heaven or hell to put me in. And so forgive me, God. That was then. This is now. This is at the end. I covenant, God, resolve to worship you with my heart, with my being, with everything that I have, that you would be glorified. As we begin this process of going deeper into worship, I want to bring you more than a song. Because a song in itself is not what you desire. You want my body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable as my spiritual act. So Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Speak, Lord, speak, speak, speak. Forgive me.